Fu. I'm an associate professor at the University of Michigan. And I'm going to give you a little highlight about security and privacy research, which is one of the many things you can do uh, in computing. Um, so the way I like to phrase this is that you've probably in computing courses been told to write correct software, I hope. Uh, and so, for this particular key entry system into a, a hotel, I went to uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, you, obviously if you enter the code, the door should open. So that's how you know it's correct. But getting security right is a little bit more difficult than traditional programming. So um, for this particular hotel, um, it may have been designed by committee, uh, because the hotel decided to put a plastic placard with the uh, pin code there. <laughs> and if you can't read English numbers, they have it in Spanish as well. <laughs> So security is a very hard property to achieve. It's a negative goal, it's very difficult to prove, and that's why it's fun. Uh, so my background, um, I was actually a student at MIT uh, a while ago, came here 20 years ago, um, worked in a number of places, uh, internships and such, uh, and I've recently moved to Michigan. And so just to uh, uh, give you one quick slide, this is our computer science building in Michigan. Uh, we have right angles in our building. Um, <laughs> And, um, and uh, what's interesting about this photo is um, uh, the, the Beisters gave, I forgot, it was like 10 or 20 million or something, uh, uh, donated and, and they named the, the building the Bob and Betty Beister Building, EBD. Uh, and then one day a hot tub appeared on the roof. Uh, and they called it the Bob and Betty Beister Public. Uh, <laughs> nobody really knows how it got there. But it was enjoyed by many faculty and students. <laughs> um, uh, so what I'm going to do is just tell you about some of the fun things going on in security and privacy research, and this is all based upon my students. Um, what they'll quickly learn is that the faculty may give ideas and confidence to the students, but the students are the ones who really carry out the work. Um, so some of the work I'm going to talk about has to do with um, uh, the security of medical devices. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about computer architecture, uh, but if you want to talk with me later, I can tell you how to build a time machine out of decaying uh, memory. Um, but mainly what I want to talk about is how to create trustworthy medical device software. Um, we all have had some kind of healthcare or wellness in computing and software is everywhere. And so one of the first questions I will ask is, well, if you're getting a sensor reading, for instance, for health, how do you trust the readings from the sensor? Um, so one of my students uh, did a study uh, on pacemakers. We found a bunch of pacemakers. Um, we were sort of dumpster diving through medical ways. Um, and we discovered by accident that headphones interfered with the um, sensing on, uh, inside some of these medical devices. And so from that, actually, there was an advisory uh, for patients to be careful about putting some of their headsets near themselves because it actually interferes with the function of the device. Um, so there we are uh, using our earbuds for our, our, our experiments. Um, there are also some interesting things you can do with sensor technology. Um, there are a number of different research groups that work in sensors. Uh, so here are a couple of my uh, former graduate students who are working on what we have a, a batteryless sensor. It's actually powered through RF. It harvests radio waves to power up a little microcontroller, and then you write code, uh, and you can literally have the code run about 300 milliseconds before the computer dies. Uh, and so all the students are working on compiler technology uh, to make those systems um, still work even without power. Um, continuing on the medical theme, um, why do you trust wireless? Does anyone, anyone hook up to the wireless here? Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, but uh, medical devices are wireless now, too. So this is a um, photo of an early pacemaker from the Medtronic Museum up in Minneapolis. And can anyone guess, um, this is before wireless existed, um, can anyone guess what that little piece of metal is? A wire. It's a, uh, a wire. That's first guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Does it come out of the body to get the Does it come out? No, this is not the board or anything like that. Uh, any other? We'll give a third chance. No. Okay, so that's actually a needle. So the way the devices used to be programmed before they were wireless is the physician would ask the uh, patient, please lift up your arm and would take a needle, punch it through the armpit, uh, uh, armpit, and twist a potentiometer to change the heart rate. Um, so there's actually a very good reason to add wireless because it reduces the chance for infection. And infection is actually one of the greatest risks in this kind of medical care. So wireless brought great benefits, but if you start putting your security hat on, suddenly now you have to worry about the security of the wireless control of these implants. So that's what we did. Um, so we um, discovered that there's a debugging command built into pretty much every defibrillator to induce a fatal heart rhythm, and it's wireless. Uh, so my students created um, a software radio program that could induce what's called uh, ventricular fibrillation. Um, I'll show you a little bit about that later. 
but much of our research is now about how to protect these devices from unauthorized control uh, as these devices are evolving. Um, I'll just give you one sort of positive outcome. Uh, actually, before I do that, uh, I promised you to show you a little bit more about video. So I want to, this will tell you a little bit more about the defibrillators. We count on medical devices to keep us alive, but we've discovered not all of those devices are secure, making it easy for cyber criminals to remotely access your device. This is the left atrium. Surgery may fix this patient's irregular heartbeat. Patients who have a fib also commonly need pacemakers. Cardiologist Brad Knight and his team at Northwestern implant about 600 pacemakers and defibrillators each year, which can be remotely monitored and programmed. We can wirelessly communicate with these devices. But this cutting edge technology is what makes these devices vulnerable. Occasionally patients will raise the question of, you know, can someone hack into these devices. That does give me some concern. Jerry Hoffman had open heart surgery at 34 and a pacemaker a year later. I don't know what people will do with the actual data, but they certainly could potentially manipulate the device for one reason or another. The idea of breaking into medical devices became a reality when security expert and diabetic Jay Radcliffe hacked into his own insulin pump. I was able to write my own program to modify all the settings, turn the insulin pump off, but also change all of the therapy settings, which is a very dangerous thing to do. Radcliffe's groundbreaking research exposed a security flaw that could allow hackers to remotely control the amount of insulin, potentially administering a lethal dose. The only thing you needed to know was the six digit serial number on the back of this. This is an industry wide problem. Security experts say some medical device companies have designed cutting edge products, but have not given much thought to possible security flaws that could exist with the equipment and the software. I think everything with a computer has flaws. Dr. Kevin Fu tests uh, all types of medical devices in his lab here at the University of Michigan. They do have shortfalls and that security really wasn't part of the picture when they were uh, designed. Fu uses a synthetic cadaver to test out the devices. And we actually look at defensive approaches, technologies that allow us to either detect or stop uh, malicious attacks. Now recognizes Dr. Fu. He's been called to testify before both the House and the Senate. Ultimately, he hopes his research will force medical device companies to increase security. The problem with malicious hacks is what's going to come down the line in the future if the manufacturing community doesn't solve these problems. A big concern among security experts. People who are building these devices, they're not security people. They're not people who are familiar with what it takes to build something to withstand all of the attacks. And if these security issues are not addressed, doctors say technology and patient care can't move forward. There are a lot more things we can do for patients that are not possibilities currently because of these concerns about you know, someone hacking into the device. About a year ago, the FDA issued guidelines on encryption for wireless medical devices. But currently, there are no federal requirements. Tammy Leitner, NBC5 Investigates. I just want to give you a sense of this is not science fiction. There's a lot of drama. You'll hear about like Homeland and this thing. It's actually based on our research paper uh, to induce uh, fatal heart rhythms. Uh, but there's a lot of misunderstandings because of how it gets dramatized. But there's real work going on in the research community to do protection. One thing we're doing to protect it is one of my students built a custom power outlet and can actually detect, for instance, if malware is running on a device, like a medical device, uh, through the power outlet. Um, so you don't actually have to install any software to detect that malware. Um, and uh, just wrapping up here, um, research, in my view, uh, goes beyond just sort of the standard writing research papers um, and, and presenting in conferences. So some of the activities we participate in is, for instance, a pacemaker recycling project uh, where we helped a number of our physicians at the University of Michigan to reimplant previously used devices in patients in Ghana where they simply didn't have these devices. It was basically a death sentence uh, if they could not get access to a pacemaker. Uh, and we also work with industry down here at the bottom where they come annually. But um, I'll just wrap up there. Um, so that was security research. These are some of my students and colleagues. Um, and if you're interested, well, what's missing? Um, you are. So um, <laughs> uh, I'll just end there. And uh, we'll, we'll take questions when, when we get to the panel. So I uh, think Jenna is going to talk. Thank you.